What's one thing you can accomplish in half an hour? There are many correct answers to this question. Completing a small puzzle, winning a board game, going for a walk in the park, having a nice conversation with a friend. However, many young men and women will use this time to complete a video game. Some games can reasonably be completed within half an hour, like the original Super Mario Bros. or Sonic the Hedgehog. Others are games that only speedrunners would think to complete within that time. Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Super Metroid, Minecraft, a mock runner. But out of all these games, there's one that requires more execution, more skill, more focus, and more raw gameplay than any other. And that game is Neon White. Neon White is an incredibly challenging game to master. The game was made for speedrunners, and Ben Esposito and his team over at Angel Matrix included intentional skips for players to find. But the strategies used at the top level allow runners to skip even more than the developers intended. If you speedrun Neon White at the highest level, there are no breaks, there are no easy levels, and much like John Kreese from Cobra Kai, the game will show you no mercy. But if you manage to beat this game in under half an hour, you might just be one of the greatest speedrunners of all time. This is the world record history of Neon White speedruns. I'm addicted to the madness. This hotel is my Atlantis. We're forever gonna have a fucking reason to sin. Let me leave my soul to burn and I'll be breathing it in. I'm addicted to the feeling. Getting higher. Though it was first announced during the February 2021 Nintendo Direct, Neon White wouldn't be playable until February 2022, when a demo was first released that contained the first several levels of the game. The majority of the speedrunning community was focused on individual level, or IL, runs, in which a single level is played over and over again to get the best possible time. Neon White has an in-game timer for each level and a leaderboard making it easy to compete for these IL times. However, this video will be focused on the main game speedrunning history for Neon White, in which all the main levels of the game are completed in a row as fast as possible. The main game category in the demo was called All Main Missions. It was essentially a new game plus category that lets you play every single main mission from the start to finish after they've all been unlocked, letting you skip cutscenes, loads, and a mountain of text. These demo speedruns contain the first 10 levels of the game. Movement, Pummel, Gunner, Cascade, Elevate, Bounce, Purify, Climb, Fast Track, and Glass Port, as well as 8 more levels from later in the game. Godspeed, Dasher, Thrasher, Guardian, Jumper, Hanging Gardens, Barrage, and Streak. These levels introduce you to the basics of Neon White, including the basic enemies and the three main weapons. Purify, a machine gun card that can be used to give you a bomb that destroys enemies and gives you a vertical boost. Elevate, a pistol that gives you an extra jump. And Godspeed, a rifle that can be used to give you a horizontal dash. White moves faster on water but moves even faster when levitating just above the water. He can shoot and slash enemy projectiles for speed boosts that save a quarter of a second each, and can also shoot or deflect his own purify bombs for an identical speed boost. From the beginning, these demo speedrunners were dominated by one runner, Idol. She was simply on another level. No one could touch her. One level which Idol particularly excelled in was Streak. 
Rather than follow the intended path, which has you bouncing on balloon enemies through midair, she would snipe the enemies from far away, then use rocket boosts to climb up the central tower and reach the goal. This strat saved about 20 seconds if done optimally. A huge time save for such a short run. Slowly but surely, she would push the record down further and further, optimizing these levels as much as she could. First a sub 6 minute time, then a sub 530, all the way down to a 520.15. Originally, neon white speed runs were timed in RTA, where the time starts when the run begins and ends at the final input without stopping anywhere in between. But this led to an unfair advantage for some players, since the loads between levels were included in the final time, leading to players with better computers getting better times. So the rules were changed, and runs were retimed to in-game time, or IGT for short, by adding up the IL times from every level. Thanks to this change, the world record was even shorter than before. Idol pushed for a sub 4 minute and 40 second time, the time she believed was her absolute limit. Finally, on May 18th, 2022, she did it. The game had seemingly been fully optimized. Well, except for the fact that Ida lowered her record again. And again. And again. Idol's demo grind officially ended on June 14th, 2022, just two days before the full game released, with a time of 4.37.89. The demo leaderboards have essentially been frozen in time since. So, this is the state of Neon White Speed Runs as the full game release got closer and closer. IGT was the timing method, Idol was the dominant runner, and the first several levels of the game had been optimized to their breaking point. But the release of the full game method, anything was possible. A new era was ahead of us. When Neon White was finally released on June 16th, 2022, it received rapturous praise from critics and fans alike for its characters, gameplay, music, and the wealth of content. Thanks in part to a release date reveal at the extremely popular Summer Games Fest, the game also received a ton of exposure and blew up on Twitch. Because of all these factors, the game's speedrunning community exploded upon its full release, with tons of new people flocking to the game. When a game first releases, it's in a period that I like to call the honeymoon period. Everyone is learning the game simultaneously, trying to save as much time as possible and figure out exactly what the optimal strategies are. Mistakes will be frequent, but as long as you continue your runs, you can still get big PBs or even big world records. In this period, the only limit to how fast you can play the video game is how much time you're willing to pour into it. The more you play, the better you'll become. Just like the demo, IL runs proved to be the most popular category for Neon White speedrunning. After all, there were now over a hundred levels to optimize. As such, a full game run wouldn't be performed until the following day, and the person to do so was none other than Idol. Now I'll preface this by saying that Idol most likely had other world records before her 52, but this is the first run that was recorded. Also, this is the first recorded run to use the new timing method for full game RTA that every other run from this point forward would use, Level Rush. Level Rush is a mode that is unlocked after you beat the main game. It allows you to complete every level in an even faster format than the New Game Plus method that the demo used. What's even better is the fact that it gives you an in-game time at the end of the run, eliminating the need for you to use an auto splitter or manually add up every IL time to get a final IGT time for the run. The level rush category that plays every main mission from start to finish is called White's Heaven Rush, which is the category we'll be looking at for the rest of the video. Now that that's out of the way, let's take a look at Idol's run. Just like the demo, White's Heaven Rush begins in Rebirth where Idol would perform nearly every single strat that she went for in her 437 demo run. Blazing through Rebirth with an in-game time of 2 minutes and 21 seconds, she would then reach the second world of the game, Killer Inside, which features a few of the demo levels, as well as some brand new ones. The difficulty ramps up slightly when you enter Only Shallow, which contains some brutal levels. The final chapter of early game is the Old City. The third level, the Clock Tower, gives us our first boss fight against Neon Green. 
You need to shoot crystals scattered around the map to lower his shield, allowing you to damage him. Each time all of the crystals are destroyed triggers a damage phase, and each damage phase marks the end of a cycle. What the game doesn't tell you, however, is that you can actually damage Neon Green in between the cycles if you are able to hit him while he is spawning new crystals. These shots are difficult to hit since he is moving the whole time, but with precise aim, you can chip off some extra health. This extra damage, plus a massive shortcut known as Clock Tower Skip, allowed her to skip two phases. Or, it would have, but she barely didn't do enough damage and had to quickly improvise with an early kill on the next cycle. She still ended the fight in an impressive one minute flat. The next chapter, The Burn That Cures, continues to amp up the difficulty even more and introduces a new weapon that wasn't in the demo. Fireball, a medium range shotgun that gives you a boost with a lingering hurt box. Covenant begins with the demo level Hanging Gardens and later introduces two new enemies, the Shocker and the Trap Wire. Reckoning is largely the same as Covenant, though it includes more complex levels and introduces the Mimic Chests. Idols Run didn't do hardly any non-developer intended skips in these three worlds, so they'll be looked over for now. Benediction introduces the Dominion card from the demo level Streak. Idol played this world largely as intended outside of Streak, but the raw power of Dominion's rocket boosts and grappling hook meant that many skips were possible. Apocrypha brings players back down to earth with some extremely brutal gauntlets that require you to kill dozens of enemies. Idol cleared these levels out with relative ease. After Apocrypha comes the third temple, which has two of the most interesting levels in the game. Holy Ground is a largely scenic trek through these magnificent ruins. Idol is able to use a shortcut with two godspeed boosts to skip about half the level, and finish it in just a minute and 24 seconds. Then there's a second level, also called the Third Temple, which contains the second neon green boss fight. This level is quite possibly the most complex in the whole run, and it's where speedrunners save the most time over casual players. Let's break it all down. The Third Temple contains seven damage cycles, one that goes through an inner temple, one that ends on the steps outside, one that ends on the strip of the water rivers, one that ends much higher after a series of aerial grapples, one that ends after a descent, one that ends at the very top of the temple, and one that ends all the way up in the sky. The seventh cycle repeats until you defeat Neon Green. Casually, it takes players eight cycles to defeat Neon Green if they do not get any additional hits in between. Idol nearly skipped the eighth cycle after getting a couple of early hits, but for now, she'd have to settle with a time of three minutes and 34 seconds. It's still much faster than the average time. For comparison's sake, the required time to earn an ace medal, Neon White's highest rank, is 3 minutes and 57 seconds. And the required time to achieve a gold medal is 4 minutes and 25 seconds. Thousand Pound Butterfly is unique among the game's worlds, since it does not require you to kill enemies before unlocking the goal. It also gives you an extremely powerful new card, the Book of Life, which locks onto any enemy and instantly kills them. You might think this lock-on range would be limited to a few feet, but no. It extends across massive stretches of the game's maps. This can be seen most easily during the final level of Thousand Pound Butterfly, Marathon. As the title suggests, this level is intended to be a long and arduous trek through many obstacles. The game expects you to beat it in about two minutes, but Idol would do this. This is Marathon Skip, and it allowed Idol to finish this level in just 45 seconds, saving well over a minute over playing the level normally. It turns out that Ace Medal isn't the highest rank in the game. There's an even better rank, Red Ace, which represents the developer times. The Red Ace requirement for Marathon is a minute and 31 seconds, so Idol absolutely destroyed that time with this skip. But it's a lot harder than it looks. Take a look at those tripwire enemies that she's locking onto. Killing them causes the previous tripwire's hitbox to immediately appear, and if you don't strafe in the correct direction, you will be instantly killed. In order to perform this trick correctly, you need to perform multiple strafes perfectly, and not die a single time. And this is the second to last level in the entire run, 
so you'll probably have to deal with nerves too. Idle performed each stray flawlessly, and the skip, along with clean movement throughout each of the levels, helped her to finish the entire World of Thousand Pound Butterfly in just 5 minutes and 23 seconds. The final boss fight against Neon Green is not quite as complex as the first two. Like the third temple, there are 7 damage cycles, and the fact that you only damage green with the Book of Life means that you cannot skip any of these cycles. It also makes much of your movement throughout the level a series of lock-ons until you finally rid yourself of all the crystals and damage green. Don't be fooled, however. This is still an extremely tough fight, as evidenced by Idol's multiple deaths to this level in the run. But once she finished, the run would end with a time of 52 minutes and 35 seconds. All in all, a pretty solid showcase for the game, and a great starting point for the category. Idol would later improve her record by over 5 minutes, largely through cleaning out the big mistakes in a previous run, such as the missed cycle skip at Clock Tower, and the two deaths in Absolution. The run clocked in at 47 minutes and 22 seconds, and was the first to break the 50 minute barrier. But then, she stopped running White's Heaven Rush. Idol simply didn't have the motivation to do full game runs anymore. Her stated reason? Burnout. In the demo, I just found the game fun. I thought it would be fun to play full game because I found full game way more fun than grinding for IL times because of the RNG bullet spread in the demo made a lot of ILs really annoying. So I just decided, hey, this game's kind of fun. I have free time. For my, my 5235, I believe, uh, my motivation for doing that at the time was because Crash was working on the auto splitter and he asked me for help to test it out. So I was like, okay, sure, I'm down to test it. My 47, I also did that because I, I was asked to help test the uh, new version of the auto splitter. I didn't really have much motivation to be like, I wanted to claim record day one records. It was more of just, I wanted to help out my friend. My burnout from full release came, was like entirely because of the demo, because the demo got to the point where full game strats it pretty much just became can, can you consistently hit the strats and and you know you just got to get lucky with rng i know i didn't need to do it i just wanted to do it because i found it fun now that idol had bowed out it was time for other players to take their turns in the spotlight the first to do so was crash b a runner who had held a tied world record in the demo and created invaluable resources for the community such as the level rush auto splitters he achieved a 5008 in between idol's world records after the 47, another top demo runner, Tacky Tactics, would be the next player to achieve world record with a 4640. Then Crash would take the world record back with a 4543. Just one day later, Tacky took the world record back with a 4213. With a ton of hard work and practice, he would soon become much more consistent and dramatically lower his times. He achieved the first ever sub 40 time with a 3931 lowered that time down to 38.33, and lowered it again to 37.23, all within the span of a week. The work that Tacky put into both practicing and optimizing every level in the game was on full display, because Tacky was the first player to be able to marry strong consistency with difficult strats that saved a lot of time. He had, in a few short days, not only lowered the record by 8 minutes, but sailed far ahead of anyone else. He was, simply put, in a league of his own. Let's take a closer look at his 3723 and compare it to the first one we looked at, Idols 52, to see how Tacky was saving so much more time. Tacky didn't save much over Idol in early game. That section pretty much had all its major time save maxed out. There were two levels, however, where Tacky saved a lot of time. In Idol's run, the level canals in Only Shallow was played largely as intended, with only a small sequence break at the end. The strat the tack he was doing now was to shoot this barrel all the way over there while still moving, then play the level as intended, until he got to this barrel here, use the barrel boost plus an elevate card to vault over the wall, shoot those two barrels over there, use this barrel to bounce back up, kill these enemies below, shoot the last two explosive barrels, and use the last elevate card to reach the goal. There was also a strat that he used in Forgotten City, where instead of playing the level as intended, he used a godspeed boost to skip a large portion of the level, and sniped the enemies that he left behind. This looks like it would save a lot of time, but it actually saves barely any if you perform it poorly. Where Tacky started saving a lot of time over idle was in mid-game, 
where he implemented every single dev intended shortcut, and some shortcuts that were decidedly not dev intended. Some of the most impressive ones are this shortcut in arcs, where you activate the explosive barrels from outside the wall, this one in greenhouse where you can swing around the left side of the level, barely land on these steps, shoot the chests, and extend the stomp hurt box through the wall to beat the level with just one stomp card. And this one in Mayhem, where you shoot specific mimic chests to create chain reactions that wipe out all the enemies in the main area. Taki's Heaven's Edge in particular was far more advanced than Idols, with major skips in nearly every level. The one level that remained largely the same was Mirror, but don't worry, that level will get plenty of time to shine later on. In Holy Ground, Taki implemented two new shortcuts. One using a Godspeed boost at the beginning, and another using a Dominion Grapple at the end. These two skips saved him about 27 seconds over idle. Then, in Third Temple, Taki implemented 5 cycle skip by killing Green in the second damage cycle, finishing the fight in a blindingly fast 1 minute and 47 seconds, and saving 2 minutes and 20 seconds over idle. 5 cycles is the most that you could skip since you can only do so much damage to green during and in between the cycles. It's extremely tricky to pull off, but it's the biggest time save in the entire run, saving a whole 30 seconds over killing green in the third cycle. So by this point, it was well worth going for. By far the world attack he saved the most time in over idle, however, was Thousand Pound Butterfly, where he'd unlocked the full potential of the Book of Life and its incredibly broken lock-on range. With just four levels to go, Taki entered Congregation, home to one of the game's scariest skips. Normally, you would have to traverse through this entire Colosseum area, then go around the outside using the Book of Life, before making your way back in and teleporting between enemies to reach the goal. Instead of doing that, Taki did this. This trick, which I've dubbed the Leap of Faith, requires extreme precision. If you don't manage to lock onto the stomp enemy, you will fall onto the pit, die, and lose nearly 30 seconds. Sometimes the game will barely lock on, then you'll lose the lock on, and you will die. If you do manage to get the trick, you save 6 seconds. Most people would say it doesn't seem worth going for, but Taki wasn't afraid. He'd take whatever time save he could get. Going into Marathon, Taggy performed a more advanced version of the Marathon skip, where he used even more of the tripwire enemies hanging above the map, and skipped much more of the level. He unfortunately died on his first attempt, costing him the first 36 minute time, but was still able to finish Thousand Pound Butterfly in 3 minutes and 3 seconds, a whole 2 minutes and 20 seconds faster than Idol. One clean Absolution fight later, and he would finish with a new world record. Despite achieving a time that any player could be proud of, Taki continued to grind. He wanted more. He wanted a complete and utter victory. But the game was still new, and competition was fierce. It had been too long since someone had challenged Taki, but that someone would finally arrive. And their name was Azare. Azrae was a newcomer to Neon White speedrunning, but he was an established partner streamer on Twitch, who had earned top times in games such as The Forgotten City, The Talos Principle, Rocket Robot on Wheels, Portal 2, Ukulele, Dishonored 2, The Turing Test, and Left 4 Dead 2. As soon as the full Neon White came out, he went hard on grinding the game, pushing it further than it had ever been pushed before. By June 26th, 2022, he had come as close as one second away from Taki's world record. And then just a few hours later, in the midnight hour of June 27th, he did it. He smashed the world record with a 36-20. 
Not bad for a dead guy, huh? 3620. Good luck, Tacky. <laughs> Tacky's sum of bests, which is a combination of your best times achieved in all levels, was a 3546. Azure's sob was even lower than Tacky's at 3528, which means if he could match his best segments, he had the potential to play better than Tacky possibly could. Not one to back down from a challenge, Tacky went back to the world record grind. Tacky had done something incredible. He had not only beaten the record, but broken a huge barrier for White's rush speedruns. Sub 36 minutes. Getting a time this good required insane strats, near perfect execution across all 96 levels, and steely focus. Surely a time this good wouldn't be beaten for a while. I mean, come on. A record this good had to stand for at least a few weeks. I have a milkshake and surprise. Very healthy dinner from the McDumbles. <laughs> Azuay was on an insane run. He had just made it to the final level of the game. If he played perfectly, he could get a 35-45. All that stood between him and an insane world record was one more battle with Neon Green. Heartbreaking, a near perfect run dead to the very last level. Azure had just tasted the forbidden fruit, and he was hungry. He wanted the world record, and he wanted it now. It's fine, let's do it again. He had already gotten one great pace today, which meant he could do it again. But the chances of two world record pace runs in one day were slim. Still, Azure kept trying. Oh! I'll take it. <laughs> a 35-36 was an insane time for this early in the game's lifespan. Azure did most of the same strats that Tacky did, but he was saving time everywhere. Azure was implementing more slash boosts, more projectile deflections, and went out of his way to shoot as many enemy bullets as possible. Most important of all, he barely hesitated while performing all this advanced movement. One great example of this was his usage of fast canals. Compared to Tacky, Azrae was moving the entire time, hitting all of his shots on the fly, but he still executed the strat flawlessly. Azrae did perform a couple of new skips later in the run. The first was Fast Mirror, where instead of following the level's vertical climb as intended, Azrae sniped the last three balloon enemies with rockets, bounced between the explosive barrels, grappled onto the glass tower in the center, and saved just enough rockets along the way to rocket boost all the way up to the top. This strat saved. 10 seconds over the casual version of the level. The second notable new skip was a more advanced version of Congregation Skip, the Seam Skip. Instead of the leap of faith off the right side of the level, Azure went to the left, and using an Elevate card that he saved earlier in the level, aimed his cursor through a tiny gap in the wall, and locked onto an enemy on the other side. The lock-on teleports him through the wall, and Azure finishes the rest of the level as intended. The Seam Skip was more complex than the leap of faith, but it was considered to be more consistent by top runners and saved about 3 seconds. So this would be the version of Congregation Skip that was used going forward. The 3536 was only the beginning. 
It was as if the floodgates had been opened, and a storm had been unleashed. Because what Azrae would do to the category in the next month would be nothing short of incredible. It all started with a new personal best just three days later. The new PV by 26 seconds was already amazing, but Azrae wasn't even done here, because a new minute barrier was fast approaching. It was the last minute barrier that top runners could achieve at this time, according to the sum of bests. 34 minutes. Playing less than a minute off some of best in any video game was a massive feat. But in a game as hard as Neon White, it seemed almost impossible. But almost and impossible were not words in Azrae's dictionary. The only word he knew was victory. Azure had just beaten the world record three times in one week, and in the process he lowered his personal bests by nearly a full minute. If it wasn't clear before, it was absolutely clear now that Azure was far ahead of anyone else. Or was he? Speedrunning is a funny thing. A lot of the time, somebody will stay on top for a very long time without being challenged. When this happens, it becomes really easy to build mythic narratives around whoever the dominant runner is at the time. As Ray had been on top for so long at this point, it was easy to see him as, for lack of a better term, the main character of the neon white speedrunning scene. But it's easy to do this to an unhealthy extent and forget that, at the end of the day, these are real people with real lives. And Azrae was no main character. He was just a man, putting in the time and practice that was necessary to become the best in the world. But anyone could surpass him still. All it would take was even more practice. Humps was a runner who had kind of come out of nowhere. His first stream was on July 7th, 2022, and he only had 24 followers, even after his world record. But Humps was putting in the time and the practice that it took to become the best. Between July 7th and July 10th, he streamed eight times. This manic stream schedule continued into July 12th, where he finally achieved his world record run. It was only by less than a second, but it was enough. Dude! <laughs> that was so close! Azrae had been dethroned for the first time in two weeks. The question was, how would he respond? Well, he could just beat the record again by 35 seconds. Incredible. I feel like a broken record at this point, but Azure was just that good. One useful tool Azure utilized was an advanced strat for the level Ascent in Benediction. I'll just let the strat speak for itself. Yeah, strats in Benediction were getting crazy. Just days after breaking the 34 minute barrier, Azrae was now just 10 seconds away from breaking the 33 minute barrier. It would take an insane run to do it, since Azrae would have to play 33 seconds off his sum of bests. And indeed, it would take 10 more days for this barrier to be broken. But when it happened, it didn't just break. It was completely demolished. And it wasn't even Azrae who did it. For the first time in Neon White speedrunning history, two players had traded the world record multiple times in a row. 
and both of these cuts had pushed the record down by nearly one and a half minutes. By now it was clear that Humps was a grinder. His streams were far more dedicated to practice than any other runner before him, and he would often spend hours performing ILs of various levels just to make sure he could pull off the strats and world record pace speedruns. It was a huge asset to his gameplay, as rigorous practice of individual levels was both the best way to learn extremely difficult strats and to improve your consistency. His hours and hours of practice meant that he was able to match Azure's mastery over the game's mechanics, and even surpassed it in many places. He also started going for some risky strats that had been done in ILs, but never in full game runs, such as intentional deaths in both Clock Tower and Absolution boss fights that skip part of Green's death animation, precise purify shots and bomb throws in Bouquet that allowed him to go around the outside of the buildings, an earlier wall climb along the outer walls in Swing, and early hits on Green's crystals with Godspeed and Dominion shots in Absolution. Humps was certainly skilled, but as we refused to stay down for long. In just two days, Azure would take the world record back with just 9 seconds to spare, mostly thanks to the implementation of some of the risky strats that Humps was going for, like the Clock Tower and Absolution Death Abuse and Fast Bouquet. It wasn't a massive cut to the record like his last few had been, but it was enough to close the gap. However, this world record is bittersweet to look back on, as it would be Azure's last world record in White's Heaven Rush. With Azure gone, it was time for Humps to take the spotlight. An extremely impressive record. Humps had just broken the 33 minute barrier, a huge milestone for Neon White speedrunning at the time. He had also just become the first player since Tacky to break two minute barriers in a row. The movement that was being done in runs was starting to get to the level of insanity. This could especially be seen in Apocrypha, where Humps saved most of his time over his previous PB. In speedrunning, a gold split is when you get your best ever time on a split. In this run, Humps gold at Escalation God Streak, Mayhem, and Trapwire, meaning 4 out of the 10 levels in Apocrypha were being played better than ever before. Very impressive. In the past, with Azure hot on his tail, Humps' records had been beaten incredibly quickly, in just 1-2 to two days. Now, with Azure gone, Humps' 32-23 would be his longest standing record at the time, lasting for over a week. But Humps wouldn't stay uncontested for long. It was time for a new hero to rise up to the challenge. Introducing Bladen. Like Azure, Bladen was new to the neon white speedrunning scene, but he was also an established streamer who had already earned top times in games such as Titanfall, Solar Ash, Ghost Runner, and Call of Duty Black Ops 2 Zombies. In a very short amount of time, they had gone from a complete novice at the game to a double world record holder, taking both the White's Heaven Rush world record and the Any% Percent world record, where you start from a fresh file and beat the game as fast as possible, which requires you to skip through cutscenes and text. Let's take a look at his White's Rush world record. Bladen spent all of early game scrapping together bits and pieces of time save, barely staying even with his own PB of 3321, nearly a minute slower than the world record. Neon White's early game had pretty much been squeezed dry of time saved by this point. Now, you just had to hope that you could play as perfectly as possible until Clock Tower. Once they hit the burn that cures, Bladen began to pick up significant time save. They would continue to scrape seconds in Covenant and Reckoning, then save another 12 seconds in Benediction. They'd have saved more if not for an unfortunate mistake in Streak, which even at this point was still one of the game's hardest levels. 
but they made most of it back with a beautiful fast mirror. Apocrypha was a back and forth between time loss and time save, but a clean ending and a massive 27 second time save in Fortress put Blade in a minute and 15 seconds ahead of their PB, and about 5 seconds ahead of the world record. One clean holy ground later, and it was time for the third temple. If Bladen couldn't get 5 cycle skip, the world record would be a lost cause. They got it, and were now 8 seconds ahead of the world record. It would be theirs, as long as they could get through Thousand Pound Butterfly with no major damage. Bladen completed Thousand Pound Butterfly in a blindingly fast 2 minutes and 8 seconds, the fastest it had ever been done in a run. They were now a whole 20 seconds ahead of the world record. Neon Green was the only obstacle left, and he stood no chance against this gamer. Once the fight was over, Bladen had claimed the world's first sub 32 minute time. Holy shit dude! We're fucking gaming! Holy shit! Holy shit, dude! By this point, White's Heaven Rush was approaching the barrier that was destined to be the most important in all of its world record history. Sub 30 minutes. A time of less than 30 minutes had been known to be theoretically possible ever since the game's launch, but the execution required to pull it off would be astronomical. Even at this point in the game's history, with the world record seemingly so optimized, there were still many ILs that had not been matched in real-time runs yet. After all, there was a big difference between playing perfectly for 10 seconds and playing perfectly for over half an hour. But if every current IL record at this point was matched in a real-time run, the time would be 28 minutes and 42 seconds. Considering the fact that top runners already played less than a minute off their sum of vests, this combined sum of ILs left enough margin for error to make a sub-30, or as some people like to call it, 2x, theoretically possible. Of course, it would be too soon to be thinking so far into the future. Right now, the thing that runners needed to focus on was beating the world record. And that was proving to be a difficult task, as Bladen's world record would be the longest the game had ever seen. Weeks passed. Try as they might, neither Humps nor Bladen could beat this record. The days of multiple world records in a week were over. Now every improvement would be a struggle. This is what happens when a category becomes extremely optimized. You have to fight for every inch. Finally, on September 4th, 2022, Humps did it. He beat the world record by 10 seconds. Yes, dude! Let's go. Let's fucking go! That might not sound like a lot compared to many of the game's previous world records, but you have to remember, Humps' last PB was a 32-23. So this was a personal best by over 30 seconds for him, which is a big deal. And because of how optimized the category had become, a 10 second world record was no easy feat. One extremely hard strat that debuted in this run was an even faster quick kill on the second Neon Green boss fight in the third temple. By shooting Green at every single possible opportunity, top players could defeat him before the second cycle had even ended, a 5 plus cycle skip. This strategy is incredibly complex, and there are a lot of smaller strategies throughout the level that make this possible. Vinny has a great video on how to perform it, as well as backups if you miss any damage, which I'll include in the description. If you get it perfectly, you can beat the level in just under a minute. Strats were being performed now that left no margin for error, and even with that extreme level of difficulty, the balance between skill and consistency that this category had required never went away. The bar just kept getting set higher and higher. 
Humps was one of those players who had proven time and again that he had what it took to clear that bar. And now he was on top. His longtime rival, Azure, had seemingly retired from the neon white speedrunning scene, having not streamed the game in over a month. There was nowhere left to go but up, and no one to challenge him. Well, almost no one. On September 12th, 2022, Bladen would come blazing back into the competition with a new PB of 31 minutes and 41 seconds. The thing about this run is, just a few hours later, Humps achieved a time of 31 minutes and 34 seconds. What's more, Bladen's PB also suffered a humiliating 22 second time loss in Trapwire. If it weren't for this time loss, they would have kept the world record. Heartbreaking, but Bladen wasn't done yet. Soon, they'd have a chance at redemption. Despite a tragic time loss due to a failure to set up Fast Mirror, Bladen made up all that time and more by cleaning up his time losses in Apocrypha. And though they missed 5 plus cycle skip in 3rd Temple, they still got 5 cycle skip and played 1000 pound butterfly in absolution beautifully. With this record, the sub 31 minute barrier stood just 25 seconds away. It was no longer a matter of if it would be broken, but when. Both Humps and Bladen were determined to do it. And both were so evenly matched that it seemed like either of them could take the record at any moment. So the real question was, who would be the first? Once again, weeks passed as Bladen's record stayed on top. Two weeks turned into three, then four, then a month. The White's Heaven Rush record was so difficult to beat now that even with Humps actively running the game, he couldn't shave those 11 seconds. Bladen had been live just once since September 17th. No one else had risen up as a world record contender. It seemed that, after months of multiple records within weeks of each other, Neon White had finally reached its dry spell. Records would be few and far between now, but whenever someone did get a record, it would be a momentous occasion. Two seconds. It had taken a month for the record to be beaten, and Humps only lowered it by two seconds. If that's not a sign of how optimized this game was now, I don't know what is. Unfortunately, Humps didn't record this run, as he was not proud of it. However, we do have proof that the record existed, thanks to a screenshot posted in the Discord, as well as a few of his livestream VODs in which the record shows up. As such, I will include it in the timeline, despite the lack of video proof. Like all of Humps' previous world records, this run would only last a short while, 9 days to be exact. Though he had twice been the player to end a large world record drought, it seemed the poor man was cursed to never have a world record last for more than a week at a time. The last several world records had all been small ones. It had been a long time since we'd seen a dramatic record cut, and it didn't look like we'd see one again. But if either Humps or Bladen could beat the world record by at least 25 seconds, they could get the first sub-31 in one fell swoop. With how optimized the category was now, it would take a miracle. But heaven is where miracles are made. And on October 28th, 2022, Bladen would do this. Bladen had just achieved the largest world record the game had seen since Humps' 32-23 nearly three months ago. 
In the process, they'd shattered the coveted 31-minute barrier and joined Humps and Tacky in the exclusive group of players who broke two-minute barriers in a row. Simply put, this run was incredible. Blade had saved time nearly everywhere. They did make one big mistake on Cleaner, the third level of burn that cures, due to an unfortunate bonk on the wall. But that was it. By far the highlight of this run was Benediction. Bladen entered this world 2.5 seconds behind their PB and left it 22.5 seconds ahead. Thanks to near flawless play throughout and a gold split on Mirror to redeem his last PB's failed fast mirror setup. After that, he had a beautiful Apocrypha, got 5 plus cycle skip, nailed all of the hard 1000 pound butterfly strats including Congregation Seam Skip and Marathon Skip and closed it out with an amazing app solution. With this run, the White's Heaven Rush world record now stood just 53 seconds away from its final frontier. The ultimate goal, sub 30 minutes. Blade and Saab was now in the 2940s, so it was technically possible for them to get it. But playing a minute off Saab was hard enough. 15 seconds off Saab simply wasn't doable yet. Still, it was possible. We just have to wait a little bit longer. Bladen decided to take a break from Neon White Speed Running after this run, and who could blame them? They were 30 seconds ahead of anyone else. But Humps had been behind by more than 30 seconds before, and he had always managed to catch up and surpass the world record. He'd just have to do it again. It didn't take long for Humps to catch up. He got the second ever sub 31 with a 3056 on November 12th. And after about a month of grinding, on December 5th, 2022, Humps would do this. Holy fuck! This world record was the first in the game's history to use Level Rush's shuffle feature. When turned on, the levels are shuffled into a random order that changes every time you reset the run. The feature is useful when runners are trapped in so-called reset hell. By turning on shuffle, they can play some of the later levels in the game much earlier in the run, which is helpful both for continuing runs and getting some of the harder levels out of the way early. However, this comes with the downside of having to do the risky early game strats much later in the run where a mistake can mean much more progress lost. Playing in shuffle order also means you have to play without splits, which means we can't tell how much time Humps lost this run, or whether he was on track for an even better pace early on. One thing anyone who watches this run with their own eyes can tell was that this was extremely clean. This was the first world record that didn't have a significant mistake or a forced reset. All the mistakes were small. With this run, Humps would end to get another month-long record from Bladen. Bladen had three world records that lasted more than a month, but this time it would finally be Humps' turn to have a long-standing record. It would be a long time until this record was beaten, but on January 11th, 2023, one of the most important runs in Neon White speedrunning would take place. And it wasn't a record. It wasn't even a PB. It was Bladen's run at Awesome Games Done Quick 2023. All right, what's up? I'm Bladen, and this is Neon White. For those who don't know, Games Done Quick is a speedrunning charity marathon that has been running since 2010. They get tens of thousands of viewers every year, and each of their events since 2017 has raised well over $2 million for charity. Games Done Quick hosts two events every year. Awesome Games Done Quick in January, which gives its proceeds to the Prevent Cancer Foundation, and Summer Games Done Quick in June or July, which gives its proceeds to Doctors Without Borders. Normally, their events are in person, but Games Done Quick hosted online events between SGDQ 2020 and AGDQ 2023 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, with only SGDQ 2022 being in person. Though Bladen's run started at half past midnight EST, not exactly prime time for GDQ viewership, their mainstream had 55,000 viewers when the run took place. Bladen would go on to achieve a time of 34 minutes and 44 seconds. Far from their PB, but pretty solid for a no reset of such a difficult game. There we go. They suffer from meltdowns on Clock Tower. And Green's dead. Oh, and oh no! I, I actually missed them. Okay. Burn That Cures, Reckoning, and Apocrypha, but had great early game and late game segments. 
as well as the Strong Covenant and Benediction. My personal highlight of the run was when Blade suffered an unfortunate mishap on Trip Track, missing an enemy during their pass through the level, then proceeded to find the enemy they missed and snipe them from all the way across the map. Alright, moving on. <laughs> While this incredible run at the world's biggest charity speedrunning marathon seemed like it was going to usher in a new era of neon white speedrunning, sadly, the opposite happened. Days since Hump's December 5th world record would turn into weeks, and those weeks would turn into months, and then those months would add up. An entire half a year passed, and no one had beaten it. It was almost like this was a cruel twist of fate that the gods themselves had bestowed upon the category. After being infamous for setting records that were broken in days, Hump's had now cursed White's Heaven Rush with a category-killing record. Speedrunning is just as much of a struggle mentally as it is physically. World record level runners spend so much of their career knowing that the perfect time, the time that will match their full potential, lies just beyond the horizon. Every once in a while, someone will manage to get that seemingly perfect time. Like Green Sweegee's 1435 and Super Mario 64 16 star. But for the other 99% of runners, the perfect time is only a fantasy, a dream. One month after Bladen's GDQ run, Faustus posted a segmented run of White's Heaven Rush on YouTube, which took all of the individual level world records and combined them together into one run. The time was 27 minutes and 23.33 seconds, over a minute faster than the community sum of bests from a year prior. Sub 30 was so tantalizingly possible. Homps and Bladen would continue to grind, but both would eventually quit the category and move on to new things. Bladen returned to Titanfall 2, while Humps would mostly stream Final Fantasy XIV, occasionally coming back to his old stomping ground to set IL world records. Both of them knew they had what it took to get sub-30, but neither was willing to beat their heads against the metaphorical wall to achieve it. So, I'm a super competitive person, just in general. I, I like being on top of leaderboards, I like striving to be better than you know anyone else in any multiplayer environment that i'm in and so that's what led me to buy the game in the first place was just i saw azure playing it i thought man i can do that and it's just a leaderboard i thought i could be on top of and i wanted to be uh, that's how it started and then bladen kind of kept it going from there I was motivated by my competition a lot when I was grinding the Unway, not just by Hunts, but also Azure. They were like the first uh, person on the scene to actually like hold the world record for like a extended period of time. And I was first getting into the game. It was really motivating because always at like kind of like that third or fourth place in the leaderboard. Uh, he's super talented. He's super good. He's way better under like pressure than I am. He's just good at video games, uh, so that that really kind of pushed it to the to the next level. I need a lot of ambition to overcome them because the goalpost was just constantly moving. It'd be like one day where I get like a a 34, next thing you know, Azri has like a 33, Hunts has a 33, I get a 33, they have a 32, it's like so on. It's when I got the first sub 32 was when I finally got record, and after that I was uh super relieved. I took some time off of the game to do some other things and I spent a lot of time kind of delving a little deeper and developing better and better rush strats. And I felt pretty good about breaking the record. I super knew I could beat the record again. There was like quite a few strats that we had like discovered. There was a period of going through every single stage and just doing, just revisiting every stage one by one and seeing what little things I could be done to consistently save, you know, even tenths of a second, and sometimes just total reroutes of things that I thought I could do consistently. And I was confident, like, that if I just got, like, a very clean run all the way through, like, without any significant mistakes, I'm pretty sure sub-30 was possible. Uh, as far as motivated to going back into it, but I knew it would just require like uh, a lot of effort and a lot of attempts put in to eventually reach it. Bladen, I think, was just done with the game, and I don't think anyone else was at a level high enough to take it from me, to be completely honest. I had I had like this deadline that I had to like 
match in order to get like sub 30 in time before I like transition between speed games and it just didn't really work out so I was starting to get really frustrated with the game I felt like I was fighting the game more than I was fighting my own execution it it feels you know just just really bad to to work on these strats and then you get to them and then they just fail and it's it, you check the inputs you know it, we we all play with input display and you check it and it's like Cool, I pressed the button and it just didn't happen. Uh, time to reset now that I'm nine minutes into my run. The day was July 16th, 2023. Not a single world record had been set in the year 2023. Maybe sub 30 would never happen. Maybe the community would have to settle for an already incredible time instead of reminiscing about what could have been. After all, what was Sub-30 anyway? An invisible barrier, a goal, but an arbitrary one. It's not like White's Heaven Rush needed to breach this barrier to fulfill its legendary place in speedrun history. Humps and Bladen had nothing to prove. They had already gone so much farther than anyone thought possible. If this was really the end, then at least it came with an incredible journey. But that's not where this story ends. On July 17th, 2023, Humps posted this video to his YouTube channel, Neon White White's Heaven Rush in 317. White's Heaven Rush was officially alive once again. It turns out that Humps had been streaming his return to the game for the last two weeks, attempting to grind for a new world record, and eventually the sub-30. He wasn't there just yet, but after over half a year with no improvements, a 15 second cut was a more than fantastic way of reaching his goal. Only a little bit more time left to go. And then, it finally happened. Exactly one year and three months after Neon White's release, the final frontier for White's Heaven Rush speedruns, Sub-30, was achieved. The run had everything. A blindingly fast canals, perfect marathon skips, five and a half cycle skip on third temple, Death abuse in Clock Tower and Absolution, the Congregation Seam Skip, a fantastic fast mirror. Every strat we've talked about in this video was executed in this run, and there was even a phenomenal new strat on race right at the very end. And here's the kicker. The person who achieved this run wasn't Humps. It wasn't Bladen. It wasn't Azure. It wasn't even Tacky, Crash, or Idle. You're probably asking yourself, well then, who the hell else could it possibly be? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, hello. My name is just AJZ, I've always known as AJ. I was most well known in the neon white speedrunning scene as an IL gamer, and I've been number one on the in-game global leaderboards for like a year. Oh man, AJ? AJ and I actually go kind of way back. So I know AJ from uh, Ghost Runner community. AJ didn't really compete in like the full game category of that game, but they were like an absolute beast when it came to uh, individual levels. I knew from Ghost Run that they were all that they were already like a god gamer, I guess you could say. So when I saw that they were playing Neon White, I was like, oh man, here we go again. Someone by the name of Yaki said that if anyone got subbed ready within the next week and a half, that they'd get the time tattooed on his body. So I had to really commit and spend like eight hours a day posting for it. My PB before I started running before this week was about 34 minutes. I ended up getting a 31.36, 31.16 and 31.05. I eventually got my sub 31 with a 30.40 and later that day with a 30.38. So I knew I was on the cusp of something. And then I, I majorly broke through and finally got top three um, with a time of 30.20. And I had a massive death on race costing 18 seconds, which was super rough because it, it would have been wood record. And then I got a little notification from Discord saying that I only had 24 hours left. So I hopped back on the grind and I actually got it, which was super surprising. And he, he ended up getting the tattoo. Doesn't really surprise me that AJ got sub 30, especially because I bet they're also just finding new strats left and right all the time. Do you think that your talent for individual level speed runs gave you an advantage over other Whites Head Rush World Record contenders? Absolutely, because I'd been playing IELs ever since the game came out, and I was normally always ahead by like 30 seconds on the global leaderboards ahead of everybody else. I haven't kept up with it. They probably have like half the the IL records in Neon White right now or something like that. I, I use a lot of strats that formal, formal world record does not use. Specifically, my crash is like really, really good normally in game, and it's like two seconds faster than humps. You did this run in shuffle mode, making this the second White's Heaven Rush world record to be set with shuffle. Do you think that using shuffle mode gave you an advantage over using the standard order? Yeah, absolutely. The shuffle is like a big part because I, I do do risky strats. So it really helps when I'm like super far ahead because I do those risky strats and I get those levels first instead of at the very end where they normally are. I was super determined to stop running with random seed. I, I wanted my next record to be played in order, and that was kind of a rule that I set for myself, and I'm at, I'm at least glad I was able to do that, even if it didn't stand uh, for very long, and it, the run has like obvious mistakes in it as well. Like, it's not perfect. But standard's more authentic, because, you know, it's just the start of the game to the end of the game but Shuffle's definitely the better category. Were there any individual level strats that you didn't go for in your world record? There's a lot of IL strats that can't be used in full game due to their difficulty. Dupe Ricochet, Dupe Shocker, New Bolt, which is crazy, Idol Streak, and Deal of Eight Apartments, which is all say it's probably two seconds in their own levels, but they're way too crazy to go for. I, I saw there was like a, an Aim Labs strat or something. The Aim Labs race strat is not worth it. Do I got Race? Right? Oh, you only oh. live once, you only live once, you only live once, you only live once. That being like a really like tricky route to execute, there's like a lot of snipes. It's very easy to lose time with it. Is that what they do in the rush room? No one else does it. It says 0.5. I knew something like middle school. It's a dumb strat, but I wanted to try it. I wanted to get into a world record to prove that it was viable. Oh my god, you are my such a fucking idiot. Man. Oh yeah, you damn right I'll fucking blame on you. Yeah. That's that's crazy that he went for that on a on a rush run. When I got the last level, please oh give me a good luck. Give me a sight. Okay, twenty nine fifty. Which I knew was seven seconds long. <gasps> Let's go again! No. Oh, oh my god! No fucking way! When I had ten seconds left until the thirty minute mark, I I know I had it. What? What did I just join? Adrian! Oh, he's on me! Why? What? Why? And that's why I freaked out. What? Yeah, that was an awesome pop off. Of what the fuck did I just jump? Oh, 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 o
you know, he's number one IL player and has been for a hot while. No one else more deserving at the time. As incredible as the run was, there were still a few mistakes. You had restarts in Ringer, Trip Track, Ricochet, and Escalation. No, you're good at this level though. I mean, you're good at all of them, but like, you're good at this one. There's no backup. There were some small errors on Streak and Ascent. I don't miss when it matters. I am miss that. I fucking hate you, game. <gasps> and then you also had a terrifying ending on Mayhem. <laughs> Thank you. Fuck. With all that taken into consideration, are you satisfied with the world record in this category, or do you think you're going to come back for more? Um, I'm definitely not happy with the world record. It's far from perfect, and I do want to come back, but I need more competition to spike my interest. Otherwise, I'm just going to get bored, because it gets kind of repetitive. Will I return? Unlikely. I'm more or less in retirement home, and when I do play the game, I became an IL specialist, unfortunately, so I only play like three stages. Hell no. I could not be more done with this game, man. I'll say this, there are no plans to come back to White Rush, but it's definitely not off the table. Yeah, White Heaven Rush, fun category. It's too hard. I don't have that, that same brain worm that drives me to just keep trying over and over and over. I'm open to the idea of coming back to White Rush, but it's kind of up in the air right now. I'd like to eventually get like a sub 30, and I bet it's probably like a lot easier now. Probably wouldn't do race aim labs though. <laughs> it's been done and I, I can put it down. Neon White has had a storied history over the last year and a half. Between its individual level and level rush records, the community for this game has taken it further than anyone thought possible. There were battles between giants, records that stood for what felt like forever and one of the most shocking twist endings to a speedrun history that I've ever seen. The journey to reach sub-30 in White's Heaven Rush is one for the ages. One that I'll never forget. Thanks for watching.